Hi guys, today we're going to be observing the patterns in the motion of this cylinder rolling down this incline to discover the basic principles behind differential calculus. Hi guys, Kieran here from A Clever Chimp and today we're going to be understanding the basic principles of differential calculus and we're going to be doing so by rediscovering a relationship that we all have an instinctive understanding of. I'm of course talking about displacement, velocity and acceleration. Now you may have heard of two 17th and 18th century mathematicians Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz and the historical rivalry about who invented calculus or who discovered calculus first. But that's a little bit too much juicy gossip to be getting into in this video. I want to talk about a mathematician whose pioneering work in no doubt helped Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz get to their understanding of calculus. I'm talking about the mathematician Galileo Galilei. He's known for his contributions to pretty much all walks of science. But the contribution that I want to talk about today is his inclined plane experiment where he discovered significant relationships between the displacement, velocity and acceleration of a ball rolling down an inclined plane. Now the experiment entails rolling a ball, or in our case a cylinder, down an inclined plane and recording its position at regular time intervals. Now the jury's out on how Galileo actually managed to record the passage of time because I've read from multiple trustworthy sources and they seem to be, they seem to disagree with each other. Like some, some say that he recorded time using a pendulum so he would, he would place the ball at different heights up the plank and record the passage of time using a pendulum. Some, some say that he hummed a tune to himself and that was the way in which he was able to quantify the time intervals. Regardless of how he did it, we know that he did manage to quantify the passage of time somehow. So we're going to recreate that using modern technology. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this cylinder and I'm going to roll it down this incline. And I'm going to take a snapshot of its position at regular time intervals. And we'll say that one of those time intervals takes up a time of one unit of time. Now it's not important how long that unit of time is in terms of seconds or minutes, only that it's consistent throughout the test. I've also put these tags along the front here that are equally spaced about 10 centimeters apart to uh, give you a visual aid to compare the change in distance over the journey of the cylinder down the plank. Now's the opportunity for you to pause the video and have a little think about what you're, what you're expecting to see. Right, predictions made, let's give it a go. Well that yields an interesting pattern, doesn't it? The distance that it's moving every time interval is increasing. But what's the pattern? So in the, after the first time interval, we'll say that it's moved one unit of distance so that then we can compare that with the rest of the time intervals. So it's moved one unit of distance after the first time interval. After the second time interval, it's moved a total distance of four units of distance. And after the third interval, at the end of the third interval, it's moved a total distance of nine units of distance. After the fourth, it's moved a total distance of 16 units of distance. Can you see the pattern that seems to be arising here? We've got a situation where the distance traveled by this cylinder is proportional to the square of the time elapsed. So what about its velocity then? Well, to work out velocity, we need to look at the change in displacement over the change in time, and that will be the average velocity across that interval, okay? So, let's look at the first interval. We've said that it travels one unit of distance in one unit of time. 
So that is the velocity, the average velocity across that interval. We've gone from zero units of distance to one unit of distance in one unit of time. In the second interval, we've gone from one unit of distance to four units of distance in one unit of time. And so therefore it's three units of distance per interval of time or per unit of time. In the third interval, we've gone from four units of distance to nine units of distance. So therefore the difference between them is five units of distance. So that'll be five units of distance per interval of time or per unit of time. In the fourth, again, we've got nine to 16. So therefore it's seven units of distance per interval of time. Can you see the pattern that's arising with the average velocities now? The average velocities are going up in two from time interval to time interval. We can, we can deduce from that that the average velocity of the cylinder from time interval to time interval is proportional to the time elapsed. So as, as we increase the time by going to the next time interval, we increase the average velocity by the same amount each time. Now this kind of answers our next query about the acceleration of the cylinder going down the plank. Acceleration is the rate at which the velocity is changing with time. And we've said that the average velocities in each time interval increase at a constant rate. And so therefore we can deduce that the acceleration is constant. It's not affected by the time elapsed at all. Now we've been contemplating the average velocity across these time intervals, which by the way, our one unit of time, I set to 0.5 seconds, which is quite small in comparison to the length of time that it takes for the cylinder to roll down the plank. But what if I wanted to know what the velocity was doing nearer the start of one of the intervals or closer to the end of one of the intervals? Well, I could make the time interval smaller. I mean, I have modern technology on my side that can record at a high frame rate, but then what about the velocity during one of those time intervals, during an even smaller time interval? What if I wanted to know the velocity during one of them? How small a time interval do we need? Well, let's get some perspective. In comparison, a housefly beats its wing 200 times a second. What's the velocity of the wing during one beat mid-flight? Our half second time interval seems more like a lifetime now, doesn't it? I mean, if we were to average the velocity of the fly's wing across the time interval of half a second, well, it would look like it was not moving at all. All right, so you know the time that it takes for the fly to do one beat of its wing, which is one over 200 seconds. And let's say that the stroke displacement of the wing is 10 millimeters. Well, in that case, it would be traveling at an average velocity through one beat of its wing at 2000 millimeters a second or two meters a second. But the wing doesn't just change from going two meters per second down to minus two meters per second back up. It has to slow down to then change direction and go back up. It has to decelerate to then accelerate back up. So even one in 200 seconds is not a short enough time interval to work out the velocity during one beat of its wing. Now back to our cylinder. If we keep reducing the time interval, then we'll be taking the average velocity over a time interval that is basically zero. And the distance traversed over that time interval, well, that'll be basically zero as well. So zero divided by zero doesn't really make sense, does it? What we're asking ourselves is what's the instantaneous rate of change of displacement at a single point in time? I mean, that sentence alone is oxymoronic because we've just discussed that to work out the velocity, the rate of change of displacement, we require two points in time to take the change in displacement over. And that's exactly what we do need. So in order to actually understand how we can allow this time interval to tend towards zero or get very, very small, we really need to use some algebra. All right, let's explain the problem using algebra. 
So we know that the displacement of the cylinder as a function of time is proportional to the time elapsed squared. So we can say then that we can write this as a function. We can write it as the displacement s as a function of time is equal to some proportionality constant c multiplied by the time elapsed squared. Now we want to work out the velocity, which is the rate at which the displacement is changing with time. And we want to work that out over a time interval that then we can control. So let's just say that that time interval is delta t. Now this time interval doesn't need to be a, a small time interval just yet. It can be however big we want it to be, but we've defined the interval as delta t. So let's figure out what the velocity of our cylinder is at a certain time. Let's say that it's at time t a. Now this this is any point in time. We could I'm I'm merely choosing this so that then we can distinguish it from just the function itself for the span of the whole um, independent variable of time. So let's just focus in on t a. But remember that it is it is just a moment in time that could be any moment in time technically. Let's have a look and think about how we can find the average velocity at t a after a time interval of delta t. So we need to take the change in displacement over the change in time. So the change in displacement is going to be our displacement function at the time t a plus delta t. So our time t a plus our change in time delta t minus the displacement at the time t a. And that will give us our change in displacement across the interval of delta t. And we need to divide that by our time t a plus delta t minus our time t a, which as you can see will cancel out and leave us with just delta t in the denominator. Okay, so let's start evaluating some terms. Let's evaluate our displacement at time t a plus delta t. Now remember how functions work. You give it a number and it spits out another number. That's the idea. Our normal function, the normal shape of our function is our proportionality constant c multiplied by t squared. So we need to put t a plus delta t right in where that t is. So evaluating it, we have the displacement function at t a plus delta t is equal to the proportionality constant c multiplied by t a plus delta t in brackets all squared. So let's just expand out those brackets then, let's square out those brackets. What we're left with is the proportionality constant multiplied by t a squared plus 2 t a delta t plus delta t squared. Now the function evaluated at time t a is just going to be the proportionality constant c times t a squared, right? Because all we're doing again is we're taking the displacement at the time t a. So we input that value into the, into the variable's position. Now we can start putting everything back into our ratio, into our change in displacement over change in time fraction. And in doing so, there can be some terms that we can eliminate. And we can see that the, the, the term at the start is just s of t a. It's, it's just our displacement function s at time t a. And we're minusing that off at the other end. So we can get rid of those terms, they cancel, and all we're left with is two terms in the middle that both have a delta t present in their product. And so dividing through by delta t, what we're left with is 2c t a plus c delta t. Now, the question we were asking ourselves was, what was the rate of displacement over a very small time interval? Well, that's where the idea of limits come in. With a little help from our imagination, we can imagine that our change in time delta t becomes infinitesimally small. So small, in fact, that it has no effect on the velocity, almost as if it was not there at all. We write this mathematically as 
applying a limit as delta t tends towards zero of our rate of change of displacement over time. And if we're limiting delta t as tending towards zero, well then the term that has delta t in it will disappear. It won't have any effect on the velocity at all. And what we'll be left with is two times c times t a. Now the notation that we use to show that we've applied this limit of delta t tending towards zero is the same notation that Leibniz used. Now remember, we chose to look at the time t a to distinguish from the rest of the independent variable time. But remember that we can apply this at any point in time. t a could take on any value. So we can rewrite this just involving t. And the way in which we say this and the way in which we read this is by saying the rate at which the displacement function s of t is changing with time is equal to 2ct. So as time increases, the rate at which the displacement is changing increases. This is the basic principle behind differential calculus, and it's the reason why we can comfortably and confidently dance in the realms of the infinitesimally small. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope this video has refreshed or maybe shown you for the first time the wonders of differential calculus. If you enjoyed the video, then I'd really appreciate it if you left it a like. And if you want to stick around and become part of the Clever Chimp community, then subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, go ahead and like our Facebook page if you want to keep up to date with everything that's coming out from a Clever Chimp. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.